The following program is a PBS Wisconsin original production. You're watching Here and Now 2024 election coverage. Hello, Milwaukee. Battleground, Wisconsin. President Joe Biden makes his second visit to the state this year. And the state Supreme Court takes a swing at bringing back ballot drop boxes. I'm Frederica Freiberg. Tonight on Here and Now, senior political reporter Zach Schultz on the state Supreme Court reconsidering absentee ballot drop boxes, critical shortages of licensed practical nurses in Wisconsin hospitals, lessons learned four years after the COVID emergency was declared in Wisconsin, and political panelist Ross and McCaution as the general presidential election campaign is on. It's Here and Now for March 15. Funding for Here and Now is provided by the Focus Fund for Journalism and Friends of PBS Wisconsin. We start tonight with the question of whether the widespread use of absentee ballot drop boxes will be coming back for the November election. This week, Wisconsin's liberal majority Supreme Court decided to consider an appeal to the court's ruling of less than two years ago that the drop boxes are illegal and that ballots must be personally delivered to the municipal clerk. The court's conservative dissent harshly condemned the new order, calling it, quote, another shameless effort by the majority to readjust the balance of political power in Wisconsin. Approved by the State Elections Commission for use in 2020 during the COVID pandemic, more than 500 absentee ballot drop boxes across Wisconsin allowed contactless voting. But when Donald Trump lost the election, his blame included the boxes, casting doubt on the results. In 2022, the then conservative majority Wisconsin High Court ruled they were illegal for future elections. Fast forward to today, and they're up for consideration again. Here and now, senior political reporter Zach Schultz is here with more. And hi, Zach. Hello, Fred. So how unusual is it for a court to reach back to decided law and consider an appeal? Well, it, it doesn't happen very often, but there are some high-profile examples. On a national scale, Dobbs overturning Roe v. Wade just a couple years ago is obviously a pretty big one that has political ramifications. But there's actually precedent here for that in Wisconsin. Uh, back in 2016, the conservative Supreme Court ruled that the legislature had oversight over the Department of Public Instruction and the state superintendent. They did not have oversight. Flash forward just a couple years later, and the, major the makeup of that court changed. Justice Kelly joined the court, and he ruled that they did have oversight. So they overturned an example. When I asked him why, he said that was because that original decision was fractured. It wasn't a solid majority that made it up. It was concurring opinions. And the reason that's uh, important in this example, Frederica, is because the Teagan decision from July of 22 was also a very fractured majority opinion. In that case, Justice Brian Hagedorn joined the majority for only about half of the actual uh, majority opinion. He concurred with only 30 of 87 paragraphs in the entire decision. There were multiple concurrences. And so the only thing that stands out of that original decision is that drop boxes are not valid in state law because they are not allowed and they're not specifically allowed, but they're also not not allowed. And that's what this decision is going to take a look at again. So I can see through your explanation how this is potentially ripe for uh, that appeal. But the conservative dissent to this order says that by granting it, quote, uh, the majority aims to increase the electoral prospects of its preferred political party. Is it proven that ballot drop boxes helped Democrats? Well, certainly in 2020, more Democrats took advantage of drop boxes and absentee voting than Republicans did. Historically, that's not always the case. Different states vote largely by mail. Uh, Donald Trump himself voted absentee in Florida in prior presidential elections. But it was Trump who made the case against absentee voting in 2020 in the lead up to that election that convinced a lot of Republicans not to trust that process. And then it was Trump after the election that made it part of his conspiracy theories about fraud 
in the electorate that turned Republicans against it. But importantly, Republicans, including the Republican Party of Wisconsin, is trying to shift back to absentee balloting for this election. They've made that a big part of their platform because they understand it's extremely important to trying to win elections. So if the conservative minority on the Wisconsin's high court thinks that uh, it's a political kind of uh, decision on the part of the liberal majority, wouldn't outlawing these boxes mean the former conservative majority was aiming to increase the electoral, electoral prospects of its preferred political party? Well, it's certainly the decision fell in line with what the, the standard bearer, that time former President Trump, wanted and what the, the MAGA opinion throughout most of the country was, is that drop boxes are ripe for fraud. That certainly hasn't been proven in most cases. It certainly wasn't proven in Wisconsin. And there's arguments that places in rural Wisconsin would benefit just as much from drop boxes because clerks aren't always present for someone to come in and vote absentee in person early, and the drop box would be a, a nice, easy way for someone to drop off a ballot. Rural Wisconsin Wisconsin being slightly more conservative than urban Wisconsin. Right. Well, what about the issue of sowing chaos in November for election officials having to give guidance to clerks? How likely is it that this would continue to be litigated? Well, it's unlikely in the sense that the, the, fast, the Supreme Court is fast-tracking this. They want oral arguments by May likely a decision by June, so there'll be plenty of time before we get to the August primary in November before a decision would have to come up in that case. So the decision would be in place. It's unlikely that it could be appealed to the United States Supreme Court, so that decision would be final, but there's always lawsuits in the last couple months before an election. How surprising is it um, that it's fast-tracked in this way? I mean, I get it that they're, they're up against the November election, but this Supreme Court seems to be uh, making some moves uh, differently than the last court. That's right. When the liberal majority took over, they changed some of the administrative process to make sure that things could go along smoothly. And quickly in a lot of these expedited cases. And in part, that's because traditionally the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court has a lot of power over how fast decisions move along. And that Supreme Court chief justice is a conservative. So the liberals have created a new process to make things faster, in this case, expediting, expediting this case so that they can have a decision before the end of this term, which will affect the fall election. All right. Zach Schultz, thanks very much. Thank you. As to absentee ballots, in its final session day, the state Senate declined to take up the bill, allowing clerks to get a head start on counting them the day before Election Day. The Senate majority also rejected eight more of Governor Tony Evers' nominees for appointment to boards and commissions, including two on the UW Board of Regents. In other business, Evers once again urged the legislature to release $15 million to help support health care with the coming closure of hospitals in Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls. Closures the Wisconsin Hospital Association calls unthinkable, but part of feared results from staff shortages and financial pressures. The association is just out with its 2024 Wisconsin Health Care Workforce Report, which describes a critical condition. Anne Zank from the Wisconsin Hospital Association joins us now. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks for having me. So in what hospital positions are the shortages most acute? I think um, the biggest impact right now, because they're such a large part of our workforce, is the registered nurse shortage. And so what happens for the day-to-day -day care of patients when a hospital is short of those nurses? For um, nursing, registered nurses can fill lots of roles on healthcare teams. So a shortage leaves lots of gaps. That might mean staff uh, working in roles um, besides the ones they normally do. It might mean they have to work in different areas. Um, there's certainly being asked to work extra shifts or different shifts. And does that affect uh, patient care? We hope not, right, because they're, they're trying to do everything they can do to fill. Uh, but what about patient care? Yep, you're exactly right. Healthcare professionals in hospitals, it's our job to make sure patients get the care they need. But when there are staff shortages or um, interruptions in the continuum of care, patients wait longer, they might have to um, travel 
farther for care, they might even end up coming to the emergency mm. department. Well, why hasn't the staffing situation righted itself following COVID? There's so many factors. I'd say the predominant one, and unfortunately one that we really can't influence much is uh, what we call the silver tsunami. The uh, surges of retirements as baby boomers age. That's a big generation. The other issue for healthcare is that not only is our available workforce shrinking, but healthcare demand is escalating. That's right, so as, as far as that silver tsunami as you refer to it, how likely is it that programs producing a school to nursing pipeline and career advancement uh, can keep pace with those retirements? Because I know some of those programs are now really cranking up. Yep. For shorter term credentials, those frontline technical positions that take a year or two to achieve, we might be able to close those gaps. For longer term credentials like nurses and physicians, we just can't keep pace with the increased health care demand and um, there's lots of baby boom nurses from the 70s and 80s who are now going to retire. So it's kind of unlikely that our workforce can grow fast enough. You spoke to this as well, but um, all of this is happening in a state, Wisconsin, uh, that's ranked as having an older population. And so this older population needs more care, further squeezing this whole situation. Correct. What we're also seeing in hospitals and health systems is a payer shift. The insurance patients have their payers changing as we age, we shift from private insurance to Medicare, and sometimes as um, our resources shrink, even to Medicaid, and we know that Medicare and Medicaid rates don't cover the full cost of care. So this is happening across the state. Um, of course, it's acutely felt right now in kind of the northwest part of the state with the closure of 19 clinics and, and two hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, one in Eau Claire, one in Chippewa Falls. What is your reaction to the closure of those facilities? Well, you said it, unthinkable, right? But it's also a signal of what's going on in hospitals, not just in Wisconsin, but across the state. It's a cascade of things. It's workforce shortages, um, increased labor costs, increased supply costs. Um, but when you reach that breaking point or the combination of, of um, factors is when your volumes start to shift, when you have fewer inpatients to take care of, when um, you're getting less reimbursement because your services you can offer are shrinking. That can be the breaking point for hospital closure, but we're also seeing it in service closures across the state. So very, very briefly, you say that there are signs of hope. Yes, absolutely. Um, hospitals are having to rely less on temporary agency staff. Um, staff that left during the pandemic are coming back. We're seeing that, that's great. We're also seeing for the first time since before the pandemic, enrollments increase in healthcare programs, and that's awesome. We'll be looking to next year's report to see the signs of improvement. Anne Zank, thanks very much. Thank you. Four years ago this week, the state of Wisconsin declared a state of emergency because of COVID. The virus has taken more than 16,000 lives in Wisconsin. And while the threat has faded, the effects of the pandemic linger. Here and now reporter Aditi Debnath spoke to state epidemiologist at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, Dr. Jasmine Zapata, to talk about lessons learned and current status. Her comments include discussion of suicide. Where do we stand today in Wisconsin with COVID-19 infections? I can't believe that it's been four years. It seems like that time just went by so quickly. As it relates to Wisconsin, we're actually seeing in our wastewater levels, our emergency department visits, and our percent positivity that the rates are getting lower. 
So we are definitely in a better place than we were four years ago. What should or could have public health providers done differently during the first few months of the pandemic? That's such a great question. And when you look back, of course, hindsight is 2020 vision. We know things that could have been done differently. First, I would like to say I'm really proud of the fact that we are still here, that we got through this. That was a very, very hard time. We're still facing um, different complications and ripple effects from the pandemic. So we're not completely done with this, but I'm just proud of the fact that we are standing, we are still here, and that we learned a lot of important lessons. One of the biggest lessons that I truly believe that we learned, and when people ask, what could we have done differently if we'd gone back? It's really a question of if we could have gone back in time, even before the pandemic started, continuing to build that trust between our community and healthcare and public health. When we as public health providers and as a public health system went into communities and talked about vaccines and this is a pandemic and everybody get vaccinated, here's what to do to be safe. The fact that there were so many lives lost because of a distrust in a healthcare system, even because of lack of access, because of many different barriers, that's heartbreaking. Those are some things that could have been prevented, but that was work that needed to be done years and even decades before the pandemic started. So I don't think there's you know, any one thing that like we could have done immediately at that time, the real work and prevention needed to start even years before the pandemic even occurred. The pandemic also caused a lot of problems and pain for healthcare workers yes. on the front line. Some say the industry will never return back to normal. As a frontline worker and a community doctor, what are some of those problems that are still lingering in the healthcare field? There's a lot of different issues, but one of them is burnout. There, um, in the medical field, um, we have one of the highest rates of suicide. And that is something that's very um, disturbing. I've personally had um, colleagues that I've gone out to dinner with, that I've talked with on the phone, had close relationships, um, die from suicide. And that's something that is hard to talk about, but if unless we talk about it more, um, it's never gonna change. So it was already a bad problem, but especially due to the pandemic and just the way that the healthcare system was overwhelmed, that definitely had a long-term impact on the mental health of even providers. Dr. Jasmine Zapata, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Turning to Wisconsin as a key battleground state in the November elections, it's game on. This past Tuesday's primary elections across the country cemented Donald Trump and Joe Biden as the major party candidates for president again. Candidates for U.S. Senate in Wisconsin are also out of the campaign shoots. We check in now with our political panelists, Republican Bill McCoshin and Democrat Scott Ross, and nice to see you guys again. Thanks for having Great us. Great to be here. So, to start things off, I mean, we have one candidate described officially as old and forgetful, and another as an indicted threat to democracy. Given that, who's in a better position here, Bill? Well, first of all, most polls over the last several months have said this is the race no one wanted. Two-thirds of voters said they didn't want a rematch from 2020, yet here we are. It's Groundhog Day in, in America. Um, we have not seen anything like this, a rematch of previous contenders in 68 years. Ike versus Adlai Stevenson was the last time we've seen anything like this. The last time we saw a former president run against a current president was 134 years ago, Grover Cleveland against Benjamin Harrison. So it's pretty Don't rare. Don't you dare make a Biden joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rare in American politics. And, uh, you know, the, this, this race, I think, is already baked. There's not a lot of undecideds. Everybody knows these two people. They either think Biden's old or they think Trump's got... Uh, issues, uh, ethic issues. So, uh, you know, I, I hope it's not a battle to the bottom, but um, I, I'm hoping that both of them can elevate the game and inspire America and win the job. Uh, but we'll see over the next eight months. This will be the longest presidential general election we've ever had. Yeah. And a bloodbath, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Scott, what about you? Who do you think is in a better position given the descriptions of these two candidates? I'd say this. So, your house is on fire. And he got an 81-year-old guy who comes uh, from Scranton with a bucket of water 
fire hose. And you got a guy, a 77 year old from New York or Florida who comes with a gallon of gasoline. Which one are you gonna hire to do the job that needs to be done, which is to put the fire out in your house? I mean, I think that this is, this is Biden's race to lose, but they've got to do all the work. And I care about Wisconsin. And clearly what happened in 2016 is never gonna happen here again. Like, they will invest, they are investing heavy. At the same time they're doing all that investing here, you got the stuff with the RNC where they're, you know, they've lost dozens of staffers. They just announced they're closing all the minority outreach centers in places like Milwaukee. Um, and you've got, you know, you've got a candidate who now has taken over the RNC and you don't know if, you know, they're gonna spend his money on Hovde and Van Orton, or they're gonna spend it on his legal bills. You know, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot there. On the issues, I think Biden has it top to bottom, starting with abortion, first and foremost. So I'm somewhat amazed that I'm saying that Donald Trump, I believe, is in, that, in the front runner spot right now, nationally. All national polls, most national polls. I think there are a couple that show Biden in the lead. All the rest show Trump in the lead. And it has him leading in some critical states like Michigan. Uh, ABC Ipsos had him up three points in, in Michigan, and the pro-Palestinian movement is part of Biden's problem there. As it relates to Wisconsin, I, I would give Donald Trump and his team this advice writ large. Less is more. I would go golfing for the next eight months. I would do what Biden did in 2020. I think these rallies that he has are very dangerous because he's very undisciplined on the stump. Uh, I think if he says less, he wins this thing easily. If he engages all the way along for the next eight months, it's going to be a coin toss. Huh. So what is it like for establishment Republicans to go all in for Donald Trump in Wisconsin? Well, he's the option, right? I mean, guys like me are, I wanted someone who could serve two terms who was more conservative. I lost. Uh, so for me, I'm hopeful that he'll pick someone as his running mate that will appeal to the suburban voters. Donald Trump did not do well with suburban voters in the state of Wisconsin and in multiple other swing states in 2020. He has to fix that in this election. And if he picks a sycophant who just uh, is loyal to him, fiercely loyal to him, I don't think that changes the, the dynamic for his election. He needs to pick somebody who looks like the future of the Republican Party. I, I, agree, with, I agree with what Bill's saying. He should do that. I don't think he will. He's going to pick a sycophant. And when you're talking about the suburban voters, two things, abortion and the fact that he's currently trying to pay off a defamatory suit against him by a victim of his sexual assault. And I think that's, you know, if, he, they were, if suburban women voters weren't turned off by abortion, like that's just the nail in the coffin, I think. Again, you've got to do the work. Yeah, but it's right a real now the top two issues are immigration or the border and the economy. And, and Trump's right side up on those. He's plus 10 at least on both of those issues. So if the election's about those two issues in the fall, he's going to win. It's interesting, the issue of the economy. I mean, I guess it's housing costs that are making people think that it's bad, but by other metrics, it's just not. I'm going to stipulate that a lot of the economic data is good for the president. It is not translating into support at the ballot box. Voters don't feel it. They don't see it. And unless and until they do, it's going to benefit Donald Trump. I want to get to the U.S. Senate race. Uh, Republican Eric Hovde is now in the race. He wasn't the last time we right. spoke. Are his deep pockets a threat? I'll go to you. I think the two big, three big challenges that Eric Hovde has. First is that he's facing an incredibly formidable candidate in Tammy Baldwin, who has bipartisan support across the board for the for what she has done for the state of Wisconsin, the Dairy Pride Act, the ACA, and letting you know 26 year olds be on their uh, health care, the issue of abortion, um, and you know by America, those things, things that were made permanent by you know put in place with 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 Trump's signature, made permanent by President Biden. Have these, so that's his first challenge. His other two challenges are a little bit you know, he's very clearly running his own campaign. And a bill, you know, I mean, any candidate who's trying to run their own campaign is a, is a, a disaster in waiting. And the, and the third point I would say is that he's trying his ads, he's trying to create a cult of personality around himself, you know? And there's only one cult figure in the GOP, and that's Trump. We're going to agree on the first part. Tammy Baldwin's going to be a tough out. I think your viewers should be reminded that only one statewide incumbent lost anywhere in the country in 2022, and that was the governor of Nevada. So beating a statewide incumbent is a very high mountain to climb. Having said that, I think Eric Covey's off to a very, very good start. I believe he's cleared the field. I don't think he'll have a primary, which will allow him to manage his resources better. Tim Michaels, two years ago, was spending roughly a million dollars a week to beat Rebecca Clayfish in the primary. Hubby won't have to spend that kind of money 
to get through the primary. But he's got to introduce himself to Wisconsin. I think they've been nimble on their feet so far. I like the fact that he's advertising in Dane County because a Republican cannot get swamped in Dane County and Milwaukee County and win statewide. So I, I, I give him an A for his uh, first month on the campaign trail. All right, we need to leave it there. Uh, Bill McCosh and Scott Ross, thanks very much. For more on this and other issues facing Wisconsin, visit our website at pbswisconsin.org and then click on the News tab. That's our program for tonight. I'm Frederica Freiberg. Have a good weekend. Funding for Here and Now is provided by the Focus Fund for Journalism and Friends of PBS Wisconsin.